Hey, welcome to Fire Engineering's Hump Day Hangout and to our show, Issues and Challenges in today's fire service. I'm Chief Rick Lasky, along with my very good friend and Hump Day Hangout co-host, Louisville Assistant Chief Terry McGrath. And joining us is, uh, well, part of our, our regular cast of uh, characters, uh, Chief Scott Thompson. Uh, Chief Bobby Halton is traveling. He's in New York. He might be with us. He, I, I'm thinking he may not, but he might pop in there. And uh, Chief John Salka is actually uh, teaching at a conference. They rearranged some things. So he was supposed to be with us and they uh, backed him up class to class. So Bobby and John will be with us uh, uh, next month. Um, but uh, hey, uh, before we before we uh, we get going, because we've, we've got another great show lined up for you today, folks. Um, uh, first of all, let me just get to this. Uh, join us is our, our very special guest and good friend, uh, Paul Wal Wal Watleyton. Um, uh, and uh, Paul is... Uh, from the Burlington, North Carolina Fire Department. He's got over 20 years experience in the fire service is currently the battalion chief of training with Burlington. Um, Burlington operates, we'll have him talk a little bit more about it, you know, with, with 105 members out of six firehouses. And uh, we'll get Paul to talk a little bit about, he wears several different hats there, like so many so many people out there, gets a lot of things done. Uh, what, what do they say that we run, we run the good ones hard? Uh, and he's the author of, of several art articles, very popular articles, uh, with uh, Fire Engineering Magazine. We'll get him to speak on that as well. Um, uh, real quick, as a reminder, uh, if you have any questions, zip over to Twitter and uh, send them our way. Um, our producer, Pete, will be looking. I'll be checking as well. Just make sure you had hashtag FE talk for our, our show. Uh, but before we go uh, and, and dive into our topic here, we've got a great topic for you. Um, and I want to throw this to Scott and Terry. Uh, we've had two, uh, two good guys pass away recently. Uh, retired division chief uh, uh, Kenny Wilkins from the Louisville Fire Department who worked uh, uh, with Denton County and I think uh, was it Murphy or Wiley uh, Scott after afterwards uh, Murphy Murphy and, Murphy. and, uh, and all those I guess yeah when I got to Louisville 2000 he was the acting uh, arson uh, you know investigator and they were in the process Terry if you remember of taking the whole thing away giving it to PD and uh, you know he was very vocal uh, when I was there visiting that he wanted to keep it. Anyway, long story short, we kept it and we promoted him to division chief and he did a great job with it and kind of laid the floor plan um, uh, for, for when Terry moved in there next. Terry, Terry McGrath, our good buddy, moved in there next and took that division even further. Uh, but uh, Kenny passed on and uh, uh, we, we uh, want to wish his family uh, and his, his loved ones our, our best um, uh, uh, you know, very, very, very young guy and a uh, very, very sad loss. He passed on. It was an illness. Uh, but, uh, and one of those where, you know, it just, it kind of takes you by surprise, even though, you know, he wasn't feeling good for a little bit, I guess, but uh, um, uh, we'll, we'll miss Kenny again. Kenny, you, you guys had their services for him the other day, correct? Right. Uh, uh, yeah. They were held down in his hometown is Hawkins. It's down close to Tyler in East Texas. And uh, he had, he had moved down there. They lived, uh, he lived there with his wife and um, man, for anybody who knew Kenny knew that uh, what did uh, Mark Lee said at his funeral, he said, uh, well, he put my name in there too, which I appreciate, but you know, he said, Kenny was always a thorn in his side and that's, uh, that's kind of how he went through life. But it was a, it was a fun thorn to have. He was a, that guy was a hoot. And uh, I was talking to somebody down there at the funeral and of course it's sad because he's, he was, he was too young. He shouldn't have, you know, it, it just, it's not the natural progression of things when you look at his age and, and whatnot. But I will tell you one thing, Kenny not, left nothing on the table, man. He got a life full of, of adventure and he was, I think he got up every day and, and got his money's worth. Uh, there's no doubt about it. So yeah, he was a, he was a good guy. And you know what, chief, it, it was good to see when you walk in and, and there's a lot of people in kind of an overflow capacity and, and, uh, and, uh, and there was a lot of people there from a lot of different places. And, and so he, he certainly had some reach and touched a lot of people. Yeah. And you said, you, you always knew where you stood with, uh, uh, you know, there was no surprising. There was, there was no, uh, uh, there was no surprises. You, you didn't have to guess what was on his mind. And you're right. I mean, as, as fire chief there, there were, he, he was a thorn in your side, but, not the kind that you hated seeing. There's, there's, there's two difference. There's some guys you go, oh my god, you see him coming and go, uh, what, what's he can be complaining about, whatever. But, uh, but you know, the other thing too, Kenny fought for what was right too, and uh, he, um, 
you know, uh, I'll tell you this, whether he, with some people, whether he liked you or not, if, if you were, if you were a good person, he just differed with you on opinions, he still had respect for you, you know, and, uh, uh that's a big loss at, uh, at his service chief. And, and this was, uh, you know, the, the last alarms always, a, always a tearjerker and always really kind of sober or uh, sombers things up pretty, pretty heavily, but his daughter is a dispatcher in grapevine and, uh, she did the last call for him. Oh, wow. Uh, so it was, it was, uh, definitely moving. Well, we'll, so, I mean, just, you know, thoughts and prayers are with the Wilkins, uh, family and loved ones and Kenny, we will, we'll miss, miss him. Um, and then Terry and Scott, uh, we got to take just a couple of minutes to talk about Roland. Um, uh, number two for Jody, right. The, in Denton County. Well, actually yeah. Jody has moved up. So okay. I mean, he's over road and bridge or something. I, I don't know the hierarchy there, but, uh, I think Roland actually stepped into what, what Jody's just right. So oh. right. He stepped into that, uh, fire marshal and director or, or, or the, the, the lead over emergency services. But, but, uh, yeah, Jody had kind of bumped up a little bit. So, and he's been in that capacity for a couple of years now, I think. Well, then we, so we roll in, uh, uh, SB, uh, I always say it wrong, but, uh, he, I mean, he, he had a, a, a long, a nice story career in the Metroplex there with Highland Village and Capel and then Denton County and, uh, was instrumental, you know, and, and, and really working through some things with Terry. I know you were very much involved with the vaccinations and coordinating everything. And, uh, uh, we, we lost Roland the other day too. So just back to back. We're great friends. They were very close friends for a long time, which is, oh. is interesting. Man, I'm, I'm just, you know what, we just, we lost two good guys. So, uh, God, God bless them both. And, um, uh, like I said, we wish our best to their families. Um, so we're going to, we're going to move into our topic now. Uh, I, I mentioned Paul, our guest, um, and, uh, uh, today's topic, uh, is one that's not, not, not strange or foreign to the, to this group or to, to what some of us do, uh, some other shows about the role of the pump operator and, uh, uh, we put the sub in there. We'll be discussing the vital role the pump, hat, uh, pump operator has in a successful fire attack, but it's going to go beyond that. Um, but uh, uh, real quick, before we jump into that absolute topic, Paul, tell you know, give us a quick rundown. I, I wanted you to do this. Uh, you know, I got your bio, but the articles that you did, um, and you know, the title uh, yeah, with fire engineering, and then um, you know, what, what was the, what was the message you were trying to deliver with those? Yeah, so, um, Chief, first of all, thank you for the opportunity of uh, being here with you all, and condolences to the family of those uh, individuals that you just mentioned. Um, so, the it was more of the recognition thing, the the recognition of the position, and uh, when I saw the need of it, and and uh, you know, I reached out to Chief Halton and uh, asked him, you know, what what type of uh, receptions would that get, you know, if I were to do a piece on that, and he said, hey, man, let it roll. So. Um, you know, I started putting down my thoughts and, and discussing, you know, the ins and outs, the overall responsibilities of a pump operator, you know, from from the in-house, you know, inspection of the apparatus, you know, thinking about the the overall safety of the safe arrival of the crew all the way down to, you know, protecting the nozzle person. And, you know, we, we all heard that saying that there's a difference between a, a lever puller and a pump operator, you know. So, um you know, thinking about the the in depth preparation for that, and and uh, you know, just like I mentioned earlier uh, in our conversation, a lot of people we're we're all famous for talking about the nozzle. You know, we're we're very technical on the you know water mapping and you know GPMs, GPS, you know gallons per second, and uh, we we really don't put a lot of stress on you know what's providing that and uh, how accurate we need to be on the other end of the hose line. So just the overall. Um, you know, the, the title of the, the article was uh, Fire Ground Pump Operations Mastering the Panel. But the concept behind mastering the panel is not necessarily standing at the panel. It's the overall responsibilities of, of the position. Well, in a good way, it's, it's almost misleading, the title, because when I, you know, when I read it, I was like, you know, all right, mastering the pump. And it's the first thing you would think is, okay, someone's going to be talking to me about flows and this and when to do it, switch it over and all that. And, and it, it goes so far and it's misleading in a good way. You know, it goes so far beyond that to cover all these things that are just so important. Yeah. It, it and it almost started that way, chief. Uh, and then when I started backing out, uh, the, the, the overall recognition of that position, um, 
you know, nobody gets in the fire service to be a pump operator. Nobody gets in the fire service and says, you know, I can't wait to be a captain. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Everybody wants to be the firefighter. And, uh, you know, as you progress and move up through through the ranks, you know, there's many people that are, are, are actually scared of that position because of the responsibility that goes along with it. I mean, you know, it's like you mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, you know, you could be the difference in a successful fire attack and a successful extinguishment. Absolutely. I mean, that is, that is the difference maker. And I, I was just going to, Real quick, Paul, point to Terry and Scott, um, you know, the colony and, and Louisville, two very busy departments, fire duty wise. And, you know, Scott, you've had some some tough fires. Uh, you, you get fires all the time, but some tough ones lately, even, you know, one with the May Day. And Terry, you had a, a, a good thir third alarm just the other day. And, you, you know, you guys both are bumping out. If you're not doing your own, you're running to everybody else's. But um, uh, Terry, real quick, you know, the difference maker the other day, uh, what was it like? A, you said like a she shed that got going and got both houses going. I know you went to three bells on that for Lewis. to go to a third alarm for our, our viewers for Lewis. will go a third alarm. It, it, it's it's got to be a pretty significant incident because you guys run. I used to say the reason they're so successful at, at, at fighting fires is because they bring a lot of people, a lot of water to the scene and they run a lot on a one alarm and they run a lot on that working fire on a second alarm to go to a third is like, Okay, there, you know, there's, there's got to be either something else going on or whatever. But Terry, you briefly touched on the importance of that first new engine pulling up at what they had the other day. Yeah, so 100%. In that particular fire, it started as an outside shed. It, it, they weren't zero lot line homes, but when you put the shed between the houses, it's pretty much zero lot line between the sheds and the houses. But anyway, it caught the primary house, and then it caught the neighbor's house. So uh, it had progressed to a point that, uh, the, the I mean, the fire was well-developed in both structures, but we actually split those. Uh, and, and when we got enough companies on, on scene, we were able to split them. We actually took one fire off of, of our channel four. We went to channel five, all of that worked well, but the timing of what we're talking about today. And as I look back and relates to that fire, there was a lot of challenges those guys faced that day and they did a phenomenal job. You know, everything wasn't perfect. And my philosophy in life is that this is a chaotic, this is an extremely chaotic profession. And our job is to manage the chaos and do it as efficiently as possible and, and, and don't hurt anybody. So in that particular case, there was a lot of challenges. So first in crew, just to, just to add to that chief, first thing crew was engine two. They had left the station already with a driver and a captain on the engine. The firefighter was driving the dive van because they were headed to dive training. So they responded to this call with, the guy driving the dive van who parks two blocks away to keep it out of the way. But of course he's got to scramble now and get up there. And so the timing, the sequence of everything was off. The, the first line to come off of that engine. Now that driver operator has a lot to do because he doesn't have a firefighter there readily available to help get that line in place. So a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges, but, um, the when we look back and of course it's easy to come back and walk you know when when i got there the first thing that i noticed when i turned the corner because i always try to come in i know the the most traveled path and i always try to snake in back way because i don't want to park two blocks away and walk but uh so anyway while, while i'm making my way they had laid a second line so somebody really heads up knowing that we had two you know the shed plus two houses laid a second line which which we would like on every fire but the problem was that particular stretch was going to be a long, uh, a long line. And for, for me, especially in some parts of this town, when you get to that 500 mark, that 500 foot mark, that makes me queasy. And so we always preach and always advocate, Hey man, stick an engine on that plug when you're getting to that 500 foot. And so, and, and that particular uh, functionality didn't happen. And, you know, we brought that up in the post, post uh, incident review to say hey just these are the things you got to keep in mind anyway that engine that laid that line they laid it proactively and it wasn't just in short time when we split and, and went structure fire here structure fire here that that engine was put in play because the the initial engine had was was kind of at its capacity as far as uh, uh lines that were coming off and so anyway it was a lot going on and a lot of people we also had people that jumped into this apparatus operator and, and i appreciate what you're saying about being that master of this but in this particular fire sometimes you have somebody that maybe they're so in, in lewisville we we ride everything one day a firefighter could be on the ambulance the next day he's on an engine 
but it's not uncommon to walk down the street and somebody look at you and go, Hey, I need you to pump that engine. Well, he didn't check it out that morning. He didn't come in with the head, the headspace going, this is my role today. His role that day was something else, but at a moment's notice, he's pressed into, into that, that. So the muscle memory and the, the ability to, to, to think on the fly, to get, uh, to get to our overall goal. And everyone did a phenomenal job um, uh, the other day. I, I did want to just, and because I, I, I've used this analogy before, but I was watching one of those documentaries on them landing Marine One outside the White House. And, and the guy was practicing. He was, he was checking another pilot off and he was checking. They were doing the whole approach and showing all the, the different footage and angles. And, but when he touches down, he touches down on those little two by two or three by three uh, piece of wood or whatever that, that the, the, the wheels actually land on. So I'm sitting here thinking to myself, I wonder whose job it is to put those out there, right? Because you don't hear anything about that guy, right? It's the same thing as apparatus operator. That dude flying the helicopter is the most visible dude on the planet. President gets in there and he's waving thumbs up and, you know, all of he's doing the, the cool stuff. That's the cool, sexy stuff. But somebody had to put that piece of wood out there and he had to put it in the right spot because that dude flying that helicopter ain't successful without him doing that job. And that's what, that's what when I read your article, that's what my thought is about that apparatus operator. He's an unsung hero. But guess what? Things go to hell in a handbasket if that guy doesn't have his stuff together. And, and and is very, very engaged and proactive in what he's doing. Well, and, and, and you know, we often refer to him, and you heard me, I actually do a program, a series of, you know, programs under this heading, The Silent Heroes. And, and in there is our, is our dispatchers, our administrative staff, our, our, our shops, the mechanics, and our chaplains, and the driver operator falls right into that. Because again, just like you said, Paul, you hinted towards it earlier, you know, it, it's, you know, it, I think sometimes, Scott, and I'll go to you, it can be intimidating for a lot of young firefighters because when they hear the word hydraulics, you know, right? You know, it's like knots and hydraulics. Guys are like, oh, we got a knot drill. Sucks. We got hydraulics. It, it can it can actually be overwhelming till you get till you get the guy or gal with some time on that has a way of explaining things to you that makes sense and, and helps eliminate that fear. And I had one of those people do it for me. That's like John Salka's engine company book. You know, it's one of the best books, if not the best book in the business on engine company operations. And he, he just has a way of breaking things down. You know, his whole thing, Scott, you've heard it before, Terry, about, you know, what he asked. So what are you flowing on an inch and a half? What, what, do the math. 1.5, you know, you know, 150. What do you flow, what, you know, inch three quarter? Two and a, he goes, don't get all wound up over all this other stuff. And and, and I wanted to, before, Scott, you jump in her, is, is touch back to, to what you said, Paul, about the, the, the lever, the lever, lever pullers, you know, there's a lot of guys that that's, they're just hoping that water comes out of the end, you know, and, they, and those are the people that are in love with automatic fog nozzles because automatic fog nozzles is just a lazy pump operator's nozzle because you can, you can put anything through it. And it looks like a decent stream with crappy GPM. And that we learned that horrible lesson in Philadelphia, one Meridian Plaza. That's why they changed the standard in 1993 regarding, uh, you know, PRVs at high rises or standpipes. Um, that that incident was, you know, 91, but 93 is when they actually changed the standard. It's more than just pulling knobs, you know, and, and I want to get to, I want to actually back things up here in a second, Paul, for you. And, and before we even get to a fire, let's talk about the preparation and the knowledge and, you know, our good buddy, John Salkin says, you can't be in the part of the job. And Scott, Terry, you remember, he talked about when engine 48, when 48 engine in the Bronx, he was a captain on there and they were doing, you know, just, they've never done under 6,000 runs a year. And I remember riding there when they were doing eight, nine, 10 plus fires a day. Easy. You know, I mean, so, sometimes a lot of times more. And when they started doing EMS, when the fire department, when Giuliani rolled the EMS into the fire department under the umbrella of the FDNY, and they started training them, and it, now the engine's going to start running, you know, first responder calls, they were out of their minds. We're going to miss jobs. We're going to miss fires. And he's like, yeah, well, we're missing them. Yes, yeah, 72 is going to get them, right? But when they're running their EMS calls, we're going to get theirs. And the whole point, if you remember, guys, what he said was, he goes, what, what, what's 48 engine? We're the best. We're the best in the city. We are the best in the city. And you know what? We're the best at fires. The best. Well, you know what? We're going to be the best at EMS, too. And, 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 you know, John always jokes he's not a big fan of EMS. I am, but he's not. But you can't pick and choose what you can be great at. You're either into the job and, you, and you're great at all of it, or you suck. I'm just saying, you've heard me say it before, people who aren't pa passion drive success. 
If you're going to drive and you're not passionate about knowing that rig backwards and forwards from top to the bottom and knowing how to do things and how to get it to where you're going and get it back safely, and that you're not just driving people, that, you're, that their lives are in your hand, whether you roll the rig, smash into some intersection, hit a car, a bus, whatever, you know, where the water actually comes out of the end. We all talk about losing water. Oh, losing water. Why do we lose water? You know, the importance of that while well, you're inside, you got guys, but there's so many things we just blow off on the importance of the DO. Scott, you guys are a busy fire department. And I know, you know, your whole background of training, pretty much your whole career, you know, you've always been a teacher and a mentor. I know what they do in Louisville, everybody's training the next level. If you're a firefighter, you're, you know, eventually you're trained to be the, the driver operator because everybody's a driver operator and every engineer is, a, you know, you may not use him or her as a captain, but everybody's trained at level, it, you know, and we'll, we'll jump back to Paul here in a second. We'll get, like I said, back to step one or, you know, but Scott, the importance of the colony with your driver operators and being into the job and being into what they do. We just talked about this recently with a couple of fires we had. And I think a good part of our water system is like made out of paper mache or something because we're breaking <laughs> water constantly. The glass water mains. Oh, they are. But what we're finding out is our, our, our operators really got to be problem solvers. I mean, we rely on them for so many things, but just when we talk about our fires afterwards and we focus on that position, all the things that they have to deal with but overcome, um, it seems like their scope is the greatest. I mean, the incident commander obviously has got a lot of things to worry about, but you see the person running around that's anticipating what tools the guys are going to need inside and making sure the lines are flowing, going over and checking this, establishing permanent water supply. So, so it, you know, it's huge. And, and we spent a lot of time in Louisville, as you know, uh, really mentoring and developing that position because it is vital to the, you know, if the, if the driver doesn't get it, the rest is just interesting. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's, we spend a lot of time on it here. We, we put a lot of um, prestige in that position. I mean, obviously it's a promotion, but the skill level, and, and we want much more, like you say, than, than just that guy who's hoping that he gets water. We want him to understand what they're doing, but be that problem solver that when something goes wrong, and, and they really understand. I think the, the driver operator probably understands the tempo of the fire ground better than anybody. I mean, I think their position, you know, they're active, but they get to see a lot of things going on. So, so it's it's just a tremendous uh, a responsibility that, that pays great dividends when you have a good one, and not to mention all the other things they do as far as help run the firehouse and and uh, be that that company officer's right hand man and so forth. But uh, we we uh, in Arlington we we put a lot of emphasis in the second driver program, and I think if you ask somebody, you know, what's Arlington Fire Department's training really known for? It was their second drivers program. And it was uh, uh, something that we invested a ton of time in. So it's, it's obviously uh, something well worth putting that time into because it's, it's, it's that important. Well, and, and I think, uh, Paul, one of the <clears> things <throat> that I think people can grab, uh, one of the many things to grab out of, out of like that, that one particular article is, is not just mastering the pump panels. First of all, the very first step is mastering the attitude of the driver operator. You know, mastering the attitude that you need to have to be successful because, like I've said before, you can't be great at anything that you don't love to do. You're not into You're just going to suck at being a driver operator and somebody's going to pay the price. You've got to be into it. You know, it's not just, I want to drive. I, you know, everybody wants to drive. Can I drive chief? Can I drive? Can I drive? Can I drive? Can I, drive? I, I drove my other 13 departments. Can I drive? Can I drive? Can I drive? You know, and, and they, they all want to get up there and, and take the wheel and take off. But some of them don't even know what's in the compartments on the rig. You know, you, you see them, you know, it's the, the fire drill time, open and closing doors, looking for stuff. Um, you know, and it's that whole this, you know, when it comes to the line, instead of knowing what should be setting, you know, you should already, first of all, I've never understood if you've got, let's just say you're riding on your pumper, Paul, and you've got, let's say you have a hundred footer with an extra 50 feet underneath it on your bumper load. A lot of guys have that bumper load. They have 150 connected and they have another hundred foot. If you want to extend a little bit Two 200 foot, maybe pre-connects cross lays, maybe one a little bit longer, the back, maybe 200 feet of two and a half, hopefully with a smooth board or vindicator, not a fog nozzle. And then you got, you know, some other things. How do you not know if, if you had two, 200 foot crawl, how do you not know what you're supposed to pump them at? I mean, I'm just, th that really doesn't change no. my 200 foot cross lay. Well, today, Paul, it's going to be uh it's going to be one uh, twenty five here, but I need to pump it at one seventy or what, you know, one or eight. I'm just saying, but let, let's go backwards. The very first step about the attitude and then, the, you know, what you to be, to be into the driver operator, be successful you know, the attitude and the training that goes into that. Yes. I mean, you know, first of all, you have to have a, a troubleshooting oriented, you know, brain, because I mean, 
you know, the position looks like probably one of the easiest on the fire ground when everything works perfect. I mean, you know, water comes out of the nozzle, fire goes out, everybody's happy. Yeah, I think it's being able to accept that challenge and understand that um, things are not always going to be perfect. You know, you're going to pull up and it's going to be a cap missing on the hydrant. Uh, a ball valve is going to be stripped out on the on the pump panel. Um, you know, you lose your water supply. How to overcome those adversities and 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 take those challenges and embrace them and use them as learning opportunities. One of the biggest downfalls about it is you're operating by yourself. You don't have anybody with you to bounce ideas off of. You have to be that troubleshooter. You know, some don't take it as far as we do. Maybe, I don't know. Um, one thing that we do is in order to realize you have a problem, you got to know what right looks like. So, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, it, only little things. I mean, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you need to know what your normal oil pressure is on a truck. You need to know what your normal engine temperature is because it's naturally going to rise when you're running high RPMs. And let me interrupt for a second. Terry, you and I talked about this. Those of you know that, you know, in the city of Wichita Falls, they've had a transit system here for like a hundred something years. They used to have horses pulling trolleys and all that. And with COVID and a bunch of other things a year ago, they, they end up shutting down service to certain areas because they end up drivers. And I was like, you know, long story short, we saw an old lady that could get to where she's going to get her to Walgreens to the Walmart. So I ended up driving her and I felt so bad. I, you know, and Terry Buscabo, I, I started working part-time, you know, as a, as a transit a bus driver for the city. And I'm telling you, I, I told Terry this, I think I told you, Scott, when I went to take, you know, my, my CDL, the, the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the part you need for driving a public bus. I, I actually put together an article. I just haven't sent it to, to Diane yet. It's if you think checking your engine out is a big deal, come, ch- you know, go, come do the pre-check I have to do on a bus. And, and they stand there with the DMV and you, I mean, you have to talk, you have to, it's like you have to have x-ray vision to know what you need to be describing to them. And the things you have to check I have, I'll be honest with you. I have never checked a fire. And I was good. I was good when I, I mean, I was into the job. I checked every tool, every appliance, but I didn't check half the stuff that you have to check when you do your pre-check for that. I mean, it was just amazing, you know? And again, some of these guys, they walk out there, they put their gear in a compartment, they start up where all the red lights work and the siren and make sure the tank's full. And then they just kind of, if they're, if you're lucky, they gaze in a compartment to see if stuff kind of looks like it's there. So I was just getting back to what you, you, what you said about, you know, that, that is, that that's, I mean, it, it's huge. No one and being having the right mindset that this is not just pulling out onto the apron, you know, don't you think, don't y'all think the apparatus operator has to be the most disciplined person in your fire station. When the tones drop, of course, especially like around here, man, when that one, we have a different tone for one alarm. We have for other calls and one, one alarm tone drops. What do, what do guys do? They start hooping and hollering and we got fire and they're running. And so the, the, the environment changes drastically. The level of energy and excitement and adrenaline is dumping. And that dude driving that engine's got to, got to stay, he's got to stay dialed in. He gets behind the wheel. Of course, now pull out of station, you see a header. Now what happens, right? So now we've, we've upped it more. Now he's driving a 60,000 pound, you know, something, something, 60 miles an hour up a, up a, you know, a, a, a roadway to get where he needs to be. Well, of course, now we're hitting intersections. And of course, we don't want to be the last thing because we don't want Rick. We got to get there and fight fire. <laughs> and so, but with every step of the way, it's getting, it's getting more intense. And, 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 you know, some of this we do to ourselves, but that guy's got to stay focused and dialed in now. When he gets there, right, fire dude gets out, he grabs his tools, takes a line, he starts stretching, whatever. It's a, it's a singular focused task. We're going to do a 360. We're going to stretch a line. We're going to hit a hydrant. We're going to do all these things. But you have an assignment. You have a job, and you're focused on it. You get it accomplished. But that apparatus guy, the driver still got to figure out where he's going to stop. He's got to make sure he's out of the truck's way. He's got to make sure that he's putting his guys in the right spot to get compartment doors open or where's the best place to stretch lines from, or if I'm looking for an FDC, or, and he's doing it while the entire time on that headset, people are just doing this between dispatch, giving you radio information. And once he gets all of that dialed out, now you're going to do math, right? And, and, and figure out, all right, so it's, 
I need pressures in. What do they got? They got a two and a half. And oh man, they pulled a Cleveland load. And how many sections was that? And how many sections of five inch I drop off? Of? Anyway, there's a lot going on. And everybody that served in these roles knows it. But that person has to be extremely disciplined. Well, and it's it goes back to like what, what Paul was talking about and Scott, we talked about well, like your background. You know, it all for number one, I always go back to the attitude, then the training. You know, the, I think you, you know, if you have the right attitude, then you take on a training. And now it's like, like you said, I need to know my rig from, from backwards for, you know, I, I've been to some places where people check, they'll check the whole pumper in like a half hour, 45 minutes. I go, that's impossible. There's no way as a single operator, you could, have, let's say in a volunteer department, you could have checked every air pack. You could check every fluid, checked every compartment, make sure everything with a motor is right. You can't do it. You're, you're lying when you check that stuff off. So being able to check that rig from the front to the back, from the top to the bottom, make sure every single thing works properly and and you have everything on there you need to do your job because like paul when you get there now you're not be going well i had a sign i where did the where did the y go i mean where where did my you know that's not the time and and the slamming of compartment doors you know running around trying to find stuff you should be able to put if i asked you for something you should be able to go yep and you should reach to this compartment open and grab it or whatever so so the training and then like you said terry and scott it, it's you know, checking the rig, making sure you're comfortable on it, you know everything backwards or forwards. Now, before we can even talk about getting your crew safely to and from the incident, you have to know where the hell you're going. And if you don't know whether to turn left or right, you know, so if you're not into district familiarization and knowing, you know, where to go and and this street feeds into this and these streets are one way and, and I, you know, there's alley and the, oh, we have all overhead wires in that section of town. They're all buried here. You know, I used to say, it. you know, for those that, whether you're a fan of the Quint or not, you know, we could talk about another show. I think we have, um, I've said like the Quint operators, those drivers even have it more difficult because truck guys looking where to spot and set his jacks, you know, engine guys looking, you know, where am I getting my water from? We're going to put best advantage. I've only got, you know, again, if you're, if your primary line in your neighborhood is a stretch of a pre-connect and you have 200 feet, well, you better make sure you're putting your rig in the right spot. And so on and so forth. Like Terry said, leaving the front open for the truck, a Quint guy, you know, has to think on two fronts. You pull up in that apartment complex and you set the brake and, and, and Captain Thompson drags line, you charge a line. You can't go, hey, Cap, I got to shut it down to have to pull up because there's a tree in my way and there's a lady on a, in a window you know, on the third floor and I can't get it because you have to, you know, when you set your parking brake, you need to be able to set your jacks at the same time and put it in pump. So so for those of you out there that are, that are watching this and some listening to it, if you drive a Quint, you better have your act really together because you have to think on two fronts. But the district familiarization, I guess my question would be for those viewers out there, guys, you know, what's your department do to get your people dialed in and trained? And what do you, you know, district, you know, what do you, we don't want to drive. It's a waste of fuel. I hate that comment. You know, and we're going to wear the engines out. Fire engines, if they're designed right, are meant to be run hard and long and all that stuff, so on and so forth. So uh, what are you doing to know your district? The rig checks. And, if, and and how many times have we been somewhere, Scott, you and I, especially travel and teach it, and someone's showing you their pumper and you go, oh, wow, that's cool. And you're looking at it and all that. And you go, all right, so, okay, inch and three quarter. I bet it's something like two inch. What kind of nozzle is that? Well, it's the double uh, Fanguli uh, straight, smooth, fog, upside down, back backflow tamper switch nozzle. Okay, what's it flow? And that's what you hear. And you and you and we'll go on guy looks well, it's 150. No, dude, it's 175. No, it's one. If you don't know how many bullets are coming out of your out of your gun, <clears throat> you know, I mean, how do you not know what comes out of the end of your nozzle? You know, so knowing the flow, there's so much more. And then what are you doing for driver's training? You said it, Terry Terry. You know, we get a guy that pulls up that just drove his Jeep or his Ford F-130 pickup truck. Now he's jumping in and at 701 could be running red lights and sirens through town with a pumper. Or a lot, whatever. I mean, you know, and, and for some of those in the rural areas that have a pump or tanker, I mean, we roll them all the time because you know they're running heavy one direction, you know, empty the other way. I mean, what are you doing to to get your people trained? And then Terry, you walk through the big one. Oh my God! So you pull up now, you know, you've got you've got so many different things, and you're by yourself. And if something does get jammed up, Sky, you said, Paul, all of a sudden you lose water, you blow a main, whatever. You don't turn and say, hey, hey, Chief Thompson, you know, or, or Cap, uh, yeah. The main. No, you're like, they're in there fighting the fire, and now you have to scramble to figure out where you're getting your next water. You know, if you if you got good policy, your second engine's doing that anyway for you, or at least securing a second source. But that being said, I mean, 
this is more than just pulling levers, like you said, Paul. I mean, just you know, I mean, it's it's knowing that rig backwards and forwards and everything else. So, um, I mean, yeah, let me ask you guys. And I know Scott, where you're at, Terry, but Paul, we're big believers in training every driver, every firefighter. Forget just driver operator for the moment should know how to do a single firefighter raise of a, of a portable ladder, ground ladder, essentially every firefighter. If you're driving and they stretch the line and you're standing, now you pump, you're pumped. There's nothing else you're going to do. You know, nothing else you can do and, and all that, you know, to be able to set a ladder to a window, to a second floor window proactively, or if a firefighter comes to a window and, and you're at a one alarm assignment, there's no one else there yet. You may be the only person there. And there's some people, you never leave the pump. Pan yet. Well, I'm pumping. I see a guy at a window and, and you know, and I've never been taught or trained or I did in the academy how to raise a ladder by myself. That's a big problem, isn't it, Paul? Yeah, I mean, understanding your tactical priorities and thinking life safety first. I mean, yeah, you, you know, especially on some of those departments that are lower staffed, you know, or you're running, you know, three, three person engine companies, uh, you know, that, that pump operator may be tasked with doing extra stuff, you know, setting a PPV fan up, you know, throwing a ladder, uh, throwing a ladder alone. Um, you know, so I mean, I a hundred percent agree with that, but, you know, incorporation of that training, you know, for the driver operator, that, that particular driver operator, obviously, you know, needs to be uh, very involved in company training as well. So they can understand the big picture, you know? Well, it's some of the best videos. I'm sure you watch them. I know, I know you do Paul all the time is seeing some of these driver operators. They they're, they're very fast paced, quick, but, but, but very disciplined. And you see them in their efforts. You're watching a video of the fire. If you're paying attention, you see this guy. If he's in New York City, he's probably wearing shorts. You know, off he goes. You know, boom, he's charging. He's doing this. He's grabbing his hydrant. He's doing that. Next thing you know, like Terry said, you know, the crew's in there fighting the fire. And the driver, he's he, next to the engine. He's stretching a line. He's, he's grabbing another line and flaking out of the front lawn. And, and if he's on his hydrant, he's got a charge. So the second new crew comes, and all they do is pick up the nozzle, and in they go instead of, having to worry about, you know, stretching, you know, especially if, if, if it's, if it's, you know, what time and we got to get a line in there quickly or into another building or to, a, to you know, whatever. Um, I think people don't emphasize that enough. The fact that, you know, that driver operator can, you're standing there. If you're going to pull a second line, you, you know, the good ones always seem to do that. They always, all of a sudden they reach up without being told, boom, the line's on the ground, they flake it out. It's out of the way they charge it or it's sometimes not charged, but it's just sitting there ready to go. I think I think that that's that that's a big deal as well, Scott. I know your guys do it. Yeah, and, and, you know it's a it's a versatile position of all the things. And, and going back to what you were saying earlier, you know, a good friend of ours, Mike Rico, when he got recognized for that grab, it was exactly that—a three-person engine. He, he assigned his firefighter to hold the fire off. He went upstairs. He called, I think, one of the casting boys to throw a ladder to the second floor. They made the grab, and they, they came down. So you know that's a. That's uh, your, your versatile player on the, on the fire ground. You know, you got to understand what all the tools do, what they're capable of, make sure they're ready to go, anticipate needs, have them there when, when you know, before they need them. And, and uh, yeah, that's that's going to a lot of times determine if it goes really, really well or it just goes okay. You know, I think what the, one of the big things I want to kind of mention, though, is we got to get past this fair thing. You know, like you mentioned it a little bit. Well, it's my turn to drive. Yeah, well, you suck at driving. Yeah, but it's my turn. You know, I'm going to get an extra three bucks for the tour. Well, let's let's have some standards because it's such an important, responsible position. Not everybody can do it, and it takes a long time to prepare to be good at it. And I, I think that's critical. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it is. And you know what? It's just not, you know, okay, I feel bad for you or to make you happy, let you drive today. Now, there's always times you have to break in new drivers. You have to, you know, I mean, I, I love that when you, you look down the street and you go, who's driving? Oh, okay. I know what's going on. You know, that kind of stuff, but that shouldn't be the first time the bell rings, you know, and they're run out the door, you know, they're going to be nervous enough. I, I thought our job was to overcome all that, that innocence and all that nervousness, if you will, and as much as we can before the real one hits. So when you pull out, you're a lot more confident, a lot more calm because you've driven the rig before. You know, you know how 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 what it takes to slow it down. You you know, our, our good friend, my surrogate godfather, Alan Brunacini, used to say, you know what, if, if you stop at stop signs and red lights, your chance of smashing into shit goes away. I mean, if you if you stop at a stop sign, and, and Terry, how many times we say Lewis Will Scott when you were there, the opticoms are not intersection busting devices, they're traffic flow control devices, and it's another tool you need to use in your favor, but it doesn't, right? You're sitting in intersections as a civilian, the light changes, 
you go to take off. So, some of these people look down at their phone and the light changes again. You're a third car back. You're not paying attention. Pow, you get hit or you hit something. But Paul, talk, talk about, go back, just talk about the whole package. Talk, listen to the driver operator, you know, what you wrote about it, even more what you teach, you know, your department. And if you were just, you know, meet with a bunch of guys and they said, describe for me, what, do, what are you looking for the complete package out of the driver operator? I mean, that individual obviously has to be a self-motivated individual um, and understand the importance overall of the role of the position. Um, getting, getting back to the, you know, overcoming the adversities, um, you know, that's where the preparation starts is understanding the things that can go wrong because again, it looks like the easiest thing in the world when, you know, you get to the scene, everybody's safe, the fire goes out. And I've always, I've always mentioned this and, and that is, uh, you know, when, when, when the fire attack's over, overhaul's complete, um, you know, firefighters high five, Hey, we, you know, we whooped that fire's ass. And the officers, you know, hey, great decisions there. Uh, but nobody says anything to the pump operator. How can you judge your success as a pump operator? Nobody says anything to you. If nobody says anything to you at the end of the incident, you did a pretty good job, right? So, um, you know, you go back to the preparational part of it. I mean, just understanding that, uh, you know, I, I've got to know my routes. You know, we've mentioned most all of the concepts of it or aspects of it. i got to know my routes. I need to know my, my low overpasses, you know, especially when I'm driving the Quinn or the ladder. Um, you know, I might have to take different routes. I need to know, you know, what the turning radius is on my apparatus, the cul-de-sacs in, in my in my districts. And we haven't even gotten to the fire yet. So we have to understand, we have to understand, you know, the, the holistic approach to the position. Um, you know, once we get there, you know, I, now you're worried about, you know, pump pressures, you know, do I well, figure and, out? And how about real quick, Paul, how about you're out, you just said it, you're on your way there and you're thinking, who's my second do? Who's yeah. my third do? If this happens, who am I counting on? Who's driving engine three today? Oh, that's Terry. I know that. Oh, Scott's got fives and knowing who's driving next to you, your partners, you know what I'm saying? And, and knowing their distances and, you know, I mean, just as, you know, part of that critical thing you're talking about. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, Having those, and you know, and, and I'm sure Chief Thompson, Chief McGrath, you know, can vouch for this as well, but, um, you know, nothing makes an engine officer feel more better than to look over and see a veteran driver or somebody that they know that, hey, this guy's got his stuff together. This guy's got his stuff together. Um, you know, I know that they've put in the work. I know that they know routes and streets and hydrant locations. And, you know, I know that they're prepared when they get there to overcome those adversities that uh, may be, you know, thrown at them. Uh, you know, I've been on many incidences where everything's perfect. Everything's going great. You know, I'm looking forward to, you know, getting back to the firehouse and discussing what goes on. And here comes a Lincoln, you know, navigator running over my five inch. You know, <laughs> so, you know, having to overcome that and understanding the, the ultimate responsibility is taking care of that nozzle crew, you know, and making sure that they got what they need to be successful. Well, and let me throw Go ahead. I'm sorry, Paul, go ahead. Go ahead no, I was just going to say, you know, and, and, and as soon as we, we start to realize this, this holistic, um, you know, the, the, all of the responsibility, the, the, um, you know, life or death decisions that you're making, uh, for the, for the nozzle crew or even the crew on the truck. And then, you know, Hey, everything's normal. And we get the pressure governors entered the fire service. So <laughs> now, now we got pump operators that are, that are, um, you know, uh, trying to still understand, you know, the ins and outs of, of pressure governors and TPGs and, and uh, so it's, it's, it's a lot. It's just a and, lot. And In you, 12 months, they'll be using an iPhone to set the pressure. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, it's exactly. And Paul, I, I, and I, you, you're, you're talking and you're making my head. There's so many things popping in my head as you're talking. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I didn't mean to interrupt you before because that was <laughs> a great point. But so, so that being said, you made me think about this. So, and Terry and Scott jump in there too. Paul, just through the, you know, right now you, you kind of laid the groundwork for the successful DO, right? Uh, you know, so what are, for our listeners, maybe, you know, there's a lot of young guys and gals that are watching us that need to hear, you know, tell me what are, what are the things that, that, that could go wrong, you know, for me as a driver operator, what are the, well, you know, I'm, I'm okay. So Terry and Scott are inside on the nozzle, right? They're, they're, you know, officer firefighter, they're in there and they, we have a fire in a building. They're in there attempting to fight the fire. There's a whole bunch of things that could go wrong in the meantime that all fall on the shoulders for fixing and taking care of the driver operator. So what are you thinking 
and you're driving, you're pumping for them. You're thinking, what are the things you have to ensure go right for them to be successful? Because you said it, nobody ever comes out and says, thanks, Paul, great job pumping for us. You know, they just go, what do they say? Is there anything back on the rig? All right, you get all our tools back. Okay, how quick we got it because it's lunchtime. They never come patch or they rarely come patch in the back. So you're you're pumping, you're driving for them while they're in there fighting that fire. What are all the things you're thinking of? Okay, I don't want this to go wrong or what could happen? Uh, you know, it, one of the biggest is, you know, understanding the, the water supply that you have and, and making sure that you're not going to run out of water. Um, you know, some municipalities, you know, and even in the rural areas where you're drafting, I mean, you know, you obviously know that um, you, you're going to be limited on the water supply unless you have a, a pretty good water shuttle situation going on. But um, in your municipalities, understanding what your water supply is capable of, because that's going to play a big, big role in, in uh, how that affects your residual. Um, you know, many departments don't let the residual drop below 20. You know, they want to make sure they got the cushion for the, right. for the engine, you know, uh, crew. So um, just understanding the apparatus and that kind of all, it, it kind of goes back to the, the preparation part of it. I mean, we, we actually teach the operation of a pump transmission in a, in a, in an engine, you know, so they can understand, Hey, my truck doesn't go into pump gear. My truck pops out of pump gear, how to overcome that. Um, you know, what's actually happening inside of my pump. Do I have There's driver pump? operators that don't know that the transmission is even working while they're pumping. They think they put it in pump and there's a pump running everything and don't yeah. realize that that's all connected that, you know, I, I mean, they don't even realize that. Go ahead. No. Buddy. Sorry. no, 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 that's fine. It, it's, it just, it, it goes back to the preparation and, and understanding what, you know, what are the things that the things that I've seen, uh, you know, vandals, They'll come in, take two and a half inch caps off of hydrants and chunk them in the woods, you know. And, you know, when you pull up as a pump operator, I got to establish a water supply. Are you second in and you're establishing a water supply for the next crew? Um, you know, what can I do? You know, throw a gated wire on it, put a nozzle on it, put a two and a half inch nozzle on it, and shut it off. You know, just being able to overcome those little things, um, you know, uh, laying your five inch correctly, um, setting up for success on the fire ground as a, as a, a pump operator, um, you know, there are certain things that you're going to be faced with that is going to require the, the nozzle crew to back out. I mean, it's just going to take a few minutes to, to overcome it. Uh, you know, ruptured hose lines, uh, ball valve stripped out, um, loss of water supply. Uh, some of those things are just going to simply require us to, to back up for a second and, and go to plan B. Some, but knowing your apparatus is going to help you determine if this is a crisis to where I need to get another engine company in here, another pumper in here, or can I uh, over – uh, or, or basically adapt to what I'm dealing with here and just use what I got. Um, you know, these pressure governors, man, they, they have thrown a big, uh, big different, you know, realm of education out there for, for these uh, new pump operators to have to understand and, uh, you know, understanding those pressure transducers and how they work and bypassing those when you're in RPM mode and when to use each and what are the limitations. Uh, truck drops down to idle when I have pressure surges. Uh, it's just, it's so much, um, so many things that could possibly go wrong. And I've probably mentioned a 16th of them, but, um, you know, having that mindset of, okay, I'm a troubleshooter. I got to fix this. People's lives depending on me. Well, and, and Paul, if you're not, Paul, if you're not you, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Terry. Sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Paul, but you had mentioned in your article and I, and I, and I like this because I think there's a lot of validity to this, but you know, there's something about you want to know what you're doing, why you're doing it, but also how something works. And, you know, when I think back of the process when I was a firefighter and went through, and it was a, a very abbreviated jump uh, or process to go from, to, to be able to drive for the day. And to be honest with you, more attention was focused on my ability to drive the fire engine and not hit curbs than operating that pump. Um, now, you know, our process is now, and I know in the state of Texas, we got that driver operator class. It's actually a, a certification through the Texas Commission. But one of the biggest values that I see from that course is the fact that you get, a, you know, when you attend that, they show you a pump. It's, you're not just talking about, well, you pull this lever and water comes out. But you see what an impeller is. You see, and, and I know that's covered in basic, you know, uh, uh, fire training. But uh, the ability to actually, and, and, and some places this really hit home to me was when I started to go with the specification committee to go to the plant and you see the, the engines in, in various stages of construction. But when you go over there and, and, and see a pump sitting just on a crate, uh, you know, it's crated, it's not hooked up to anything. 
And then you go, you know, if I have the advantage to go with somebody like Chief Ashman who can explain everything to me. <laughs> but the level of understanding of how all of these components are working, number one, helps you to solve problems. But, you know, number two, I think, gives you a great amount of confidence to, uh, you know, to, to understand what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, and how it's supposed to work. Well, and the other thing, go, well, go ahead, Scott. Scott, I want to throw something at you because, um, real quick, so we don't miss some of our comments. Uh, our producer Pete uh, posted one from Grant Williams. Uh, we want to mention this because this is a great point. Another vital training for for the DOs is the art of reading smoke. Uh, the pump operator knows what's going on from the outside because we said this before. How many times you've been inside as a firefighter officer? The chief said, "I need you back out." You're like, "Give us five more minutes." Give them a minute, and you're like, and you get outside, you go. What, 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 where, where, where did all this fire come from? What did this happen? Well, <laughs> you're in there and it's the early onset and it's, you know, you know what time and the drive rapper, you know, doing what they're doing. They're outside. They're watching everything. They're watching. That's a great, you know, Grant, uh, Grant Williams with that comment. That's a great comment about, I've always said before, three most important things you teach a young firefighter, our history, why we're here, why we exist, fire behavior, building construction. Part of that is smoke and everything else. And we suck at size up at the fire service. I'll just say it. We, we, we talk a good game about tax strategy, but we use residences, tactics, our commercial buildings. We, we, I do a program called failure read the building and the fire properly, because if you want to generalize it, we, we use the wrong tactics. We, we, we're so stuck on our favorite tactic that we don't use the best one for the, for that particular job. Scott, touch on this. Cause I know, you know, all the years you were in Louisville, you know, and, and some of the, some of the, you know, like Lake cities is cheap, but in Louisville, you know, instrumental in changing the training program there for all of us. The second new engines, pri absolute priority before anything else is to talk about that. The, their job is to ensure the first engine has a positive water source. I mean, has a, you know, has, you know, that, I mean, and, and, and everything Paul talked about, and like you said, he only mentioned a fraction because we, we need another four hours to talk about all the things that go wrong, right? You know, part of that is just, you know, if you lose your water, you lose your mate, whatever, is having somebody else go, I've got another hydrant and it's good. Not just I'm sitting here. You know, I've had people say, "Well, I'm on a hydrant." What does that mean? I'm looking at it, or I float it, and it's good, and it, there's nothing wrong with it. Scott, talk about the importance of having that second, uh, uh, you know, water supply established. Well, you know, it's a play on words a little bit, but you know, we all have assigned responsibilities. We did in Louisville and in late. Our second engine, we call our fast, our fire attack support team, and their job description is to to see the success of the first engine. Uh, rather, that's, you know, making sure the water supply is there, a, a secondary water supply. Do they need to get on the line and help advance that, that initial line versus pulling a second line, block line, backup line? So, uh, yeah, that's, that's a checks and balances also. You know, you, you've got that first engine coming into the situation, and a lot of things can change before, you know, between the first due and second due. And so in our system, that's kind of our checks and balances. That, that second driver comes in, he's resizing up, and, and the officer's doing his thing, and that and that, that that second driver is is making sure that not only we have what we need to get started, but that we can sustain the operation for long term. And you know, you always said the great incident commanders can predict the next alarm. I think a lot of that goes for the driver operator too. You know, is this going to be a quick thing? Reading the smoke, understanding how much water their, their their guys are flowing, and then and then deciding, hey, you know, we need to set up to to sustain this for a long period of time. And and that's a whole nother. Uh, animal when you talk about maintenance and fuel and is it freezing is it overheating is you know all those other things that play into it i've got to think about cold weather ops versus extreme heat and everything else and and just like scott just like go, go back to the basics knowing how much water you bring with you a lot of people think that water that's in their tank is there for ballast so they don't flip the yeah. engine over intersections and stuff and forget it's not just car fire dumpster water what what can you do with that for a quick attack but you got to be followed up with a sustained source and behind that you have to be followed because we're nothing without water at a fire. We're nothing without <laughs> water. They got to be one step ahead of everybody else. The driver and I, does. Oh, and I'll say this, and, and there's a comment our friend Bill Carey, we'll get to here in a second, uh, Bill Carey, and you know how much he loves the engine. I know he's going to love this comment. I've said this a ton of times before. Terry, Scott, you've heard me. The only thing that matters on that fire engine is the water and the hose. Everything else in that fire engine is extra. Now, I know we do a lot of EMS runs, folks. Don't hammer your emails. And I know we do other stuff. But back in the old days, there was ladder tenders, there was there was hose tenders. They may have when they they drug a pump around with them and all that. There weren't like bandage tenders and stuff like that. We didn't get into first aid till you know later on in life. 
you know, the only thing that man, I've said that, you know, watch the videos, watch some of the, I love the YouTube videos. Are you guys not frustrated? Like I am frustrated when you watch, you see these guys turn the corner, right? And Paul, you're already laughing. You know, I'm going, they turn the corner, fire blown out the front is two story frame. And I'm like, I ask guys in class. So how many people have driven or drive to a fire? They all raise their hands. So you turn the corner, you pull up, tell, walk me through it. You come to a stop. What's racing? We set the parking brake. What's the next thing? We put a pump gear. What's the next thing? We, we engage you know, we, we, the transmission. Okay. And now we get out. And if you're safety conscious, we, well, I chalk the wheels. Then what do you do? If you're up north, it's winter time. You have to prime the pump if it's dry or whatever. But basically, you're standing there waiting for somebody to say what? Charge the line, send water, start water, whatever. How long should that take? And, and, and I, again, I love the videos. I despise the people that attack people on the videos. If you're, if you, if, if you know, seriously, I mean, if you're that, it just, I just cannot stand the people watch videos and sit back in a recliner in a firehouse. They've got like a couple dumpster fires in it, but like I said before, they think that the McCaffrey brothers from backdraft, you know, and beat up people, you know, about stuff, but you need to watch the videos and learn from them. And you see, I mean, when your count minutes are going by, I'm going, they should have already charged the guy standing with the nozzle waiting for the charge of line. It shouldn't take you that long to do that. Now, real quick, uh, we had a couple more comments posts as you guys saw from like one from Lincoln Bureau. Uh, and the, the comment was, let's not forget that the engineer is also responsible for the safety of their crews and the public of driving operating the apparatus. And, and I, we appreciate that comment. We mentioned that early on, you know, getting the crew there safely uh, to and from. I mentioned two, not just two, but, you know, from the incident. Uh, when you look at how many firefighters are either severely injured, paralyzed, or end up dead because of driver operator error or excessive speed or blown through an intersection or whatever, or rolling the rig, you know, that whole tanker thing that you see, the header thing. Uh, so, so keep that in mind again. And thank you, Lincoln Bureau, for emphasizing that, that we're no good. We're, we're absolutely no good unless we get there and then get back for the safety of the people. I always said for the, the people inside and outside the cab. But our friend Bill Carey made a comment that's very important about you know, preparation for the operations and, and the operators is the driver operator health and fitness. You know, if you know him, he's into a lot of stuff, but one is he's into uh, the data behind the line of duty debts and, and uh, the research he's done. Uh, and and he, he wants to you know, point out, and it's a great message from Bill. Thank you about the medical emergencies that occur with, with driver operators that there have been some of them have found unresponsive in the cab and end up dead or next to it or whatever. So on and so forth. Um, you know, he even mentioned in the hose bed and at fill sites and so on and so forth. So, you know, there's got to be some um, uh, some thoughts about what you're doing with your people and how you're doing it and how you take care of them. Uh, again, I think this all goes back to who's driving uh, the rig. But um, that second engine, Scott, again, uh, making sure we have a sustainable you know source. And you know, and, and let's uh, guys, let's forget let's forget the fires right now. Okay, Paul, talk about. We're going to an MVA. We're going to an intersection or a highway, an interstate for an accident. And I, I know about you guys. When I travel, I go up. Oh, they got a, they got an accident come up here, and I look, and none of the apparatus is set up right. Nobody's wearing anything reflective. They don't have scene lighting. They don't have control. They don't have a spotter. They don't have all this stuff. And I go, you know. And again, we all have friends that have been killed while operating at, at the scene of a motor vehicle accident, and. You know, so Paul, talk, I mean, talk about that part of the response for the driver, driver, not just at the fires. And like we said, get to it from the incident. But how about our setup at an accident on, on a highway? Yeah, so I mean, you know, one of one of the biggest complaints from the citizens is, you know, hey, do they need that much room? You know, why why are they taking up an extra extra lane? You know, um, you know, we, we preach, you know, to take a, uh, the lane that the accident is in plus one. Uh, you know, with the with the apparatus uh, angled, I've seen you know many pictures of the apparatus on the accidents and it's angled correctly, and the pump panel is exposed to oncoming traffic. You know, I, I personally like the pump panel turned you know to the accident scene. That way, the uh, pump operator is protected in the event you know a line needs to be pulled off of the truck. But you know, the, the pump operator at that time is involved in you know many other different things. You know, securing the 12 volt power system on a vehicle while the you know the officer and the firefighter is doing patient care, spreading oil dry. Um, you know, uh, moving parts of you know any debris out of the way. Um, you know, securing that work area. Um, you know, setting out a cone tapers. You know, to to make transitional areas for traffic to come. You know, incoming traffic. Uh, you know, for them to go down to one lane. So I mean, it's it's, it's a lot of responsibility. 
just on that one scene. So that, I mean, you know, the pump operator, the driver operator, um, you know, understanding the equipment on the truck. I mean, the driver operator does not only have to provide that equipment to the firefighters. Um, you know, they also need to know the ins and outs of every piece of equipment on that truck, Hearst equipment, hose and nozzles, EMT equipment, you know, everything. So, well, and how about this? You you're, you you you, you kind of hinted. I, I've I've said before we don't emphasize enough to the driver operator that I think the the construction crews have a couple things up on us. One is they usually have more than enough people where we're always struggling for manpower on calls, right? Mm -hmm. So, and people used to always make fun of the flag man, the flag guy or gal, right? The flag person. Oh, look at this boy! What a great you know, look! All day long they've been standing with their flag. What they don't realize is many of those people are the spotters. They have a radio. They're facing traffic. Could you imagine if we had a firefighter? I know it's hard to see because we're short already on manpower. I understand that, folks. Don't hammer me. But if you had a firefighter that did nothing but look that way while everything's going on behind and did nothing but stare into traffic, you know, off on the side from the face and just sit there with a radio where they can yell car car or whatever, well, maybe we can't. But just what you said, Paul, all those things that that DO is doing, we need to add to them the you know the lookout. If anybody, if your officer is looking down and some, we're doing patient care, we're cutting something out of a car or whatever we're doing, in between all the other things you're doing as the DO, you, your head needs to be on a swivel. I mean, I'm always looking back. I'm always I'm, right now. My my volunteer department, Wichita West, we had great great guys there. You know, great bosses. When I'm I'm always looking because I'm expecting. I'm mm -hmm. you know Scott Taylor. Remember when we had the the car drive off of the lake off the bridge. I pulled my, 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 my crown Vic. I was the, the first lane over and that car at like 50 miles an hour went between the guardrail and my car on the shoulder. I, I was closing the trunk of my car and I thought somebody was dragging plywood on it. It sounded like somebody dragging plywood on the street. You know what I'm saying? And I turn around just in time and I saw it go and I'm like, that's it. I would have been dead. And we lost our friend, Eddie Spitowski. Eddie, Eddie, you know, was, was with the Pleasant View fire protection district in Illinois outside Chicago. And he was the chief in Comstock Township, Michigan. Eddie's a great guy. We were hazmat geeks together. We started the same day in Bedford park. Um, he was putting his gear away in his SUV and they were set up. They were set up properly at that incident and a drunk at like 92 miles an hour drove around all of it and, and hit him and killed him. It did a bat, you know, so my point exactly again is God, if you got someone that's either being assigned to be to look at or the driver operators emphasis among everything else is guys, when you're driving, I'm counting on you to keep your head. You need to be like, you know, don't be just watching us. You see it all the time. They're watching. You know, what do you think they need next? Be, you know, be watching, be noticing, because you may be the difference between your guys getting popped by a car or a truck or whatever, you know, or yourself, let alone anything. You can have all the rigs set up properly, which is important. In that case, the guy drove around them all, you know. Um, so so a lot of things going on with 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 that driver operator. God, we could do like three more hours on this, you know. <laughs> um uh, but uh, so Scott, you, let's let go. Your your thoughts, your thoughts on uh, uh, you, like we said, uh, we we tell us the role of the pump operator and you know the vital role at, at you know the successful fire tech as a whole. Let's let's finish things off that way. Uh, your closing thoughts on you're you've been doing this a long time. You're a very progressive fire chief. You run a we run a damn good fire ground. What are you expecting from your driver operators? Man, the A team, and I, I want to go back to uh, just reference what Bill Carey said for just a minute also, you know, and you know I'm a big culture guy, but I think sometimes we allow that driver's position to be kind of a hideout, you know, <laughs> guys that, that don't want to put their gear on and, and those kind of things. And you think about it, they, and we've talked this this program, they got to do everything. They got to throw ladders or work them by themselves. They got to they stretch. They got to do all those. So it's really got to be one of your high performance members and, and not to mention the stress that they got to deal with. So you know, I want that to be one of my go-to guys. We often refer to as, as go-to guys, but who is in the best position really on the fire ground outside? You know, you're in command and you're watching all those things and you look over and you can really tell when your driver's got it going on. He's on top of things. He's paying attention. Um, you know, those are great comfort factors. I know the times that I've been in command, when you know you've got a good driver operator, that's another set of eyes and the good ones are going to, you know, put a bug in your ear or whistle at you and say, hey, did you see this or something? So, I, you know, to me, it's 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 kind of your utility player in a sense on the outside, reading the smoke, uh, like say, knowing how much lines, the, the flow and how much water is being put on. All those things are really, really important to our success. And I think a lot of times we get away with maybe some performance at that position um, just because the fire is forgiving. But I think that's what really sets apart 
you know, I, I talk about high performance fire companies versus the average ones. And, and that's, that's kind of the difference maker sometimes is that that driver operator is really on the ball. They're progressive. They're, they're, in, they're in good shape. They're knowledgeable and, and it, it can be the, the difference. So, uh, you know, I, I want that person um, to understand what it's like to be a firefighter, to understand the job that the officer's doing, uh, to know what the capabilities of that app, you know, you think about it. Our greatest investment in our organization is our in our firefighting capabilities. That even if we the majority of our calls are EMS, so you're giving that driver operator a seven hundred thousand dollar pump or a one point two million dollar tower ladder, and we expect them to maximize that capability of that apparatus and all the tools on it. Uh, otherwise, we're we're not giving the citizens back uh, a refund on their investment. So you know you go down that path now. It's just, it's, it's, you know, we could, like say, we could sit here for two hours and keep talking about it, but I want that utility player that's, that's a go-to guy on the outside that's on the ball. Uh, he's one step ahead of everybody else and, and is, is getting the job done and making sure everybody's got what they need to be successful. That's, that's fighting the fire, doing the vet work, doing the search, whatever. And I like how you tied it back to Bill's comment about, and, it, <laughs> and it's a great point. You made. I'm glad you brought it up. Sometimes that's, uh, you know, just, you'll just, you'll, you're driving for me. You'll, you'll drive. Yeah. You got a bad back or, you know, the only reason you're on the job is so you can drive because you can't wear an air pack pretty much. You can't do this. And I, and I look, I'm all about take care of folks, but uh, there's a lot of things we have to consider for us to be successful. And, you know, there's so many people that drive that they don't, I, it's not the new math. If, if my, if my, if I have a 2000 plus GPM pump, I have to know how much water is coming in there. I can't just keep pulling lines off. You know, some guys are like, all of a sudden, you know, yeah, some chief says I need a line and they drag it off your rig and you, no one's putting the math together going, but I don't have enough water coming in. You know, I've only got, so, I mean, there's only so much, it's not to do math. I can't, I, you know, this doesn't equal this. I have to have enough. And, and again, it, it, it sounds like I'm kind of oversimplifying, but I'm not. I mean, those are things that they, you know, we've got to be concerned with. Terry, you're, you know, again, same, same question, your thoughts on what makes, that vital role that that great do I, I mean i said it earlier and i use that word discipline because i think this person has to be so squared away in in so many different facets uh of an operation um we didn't even get into really into line management and and <laughs> I, that fire the other day as i was walking from my car uh to the to, to one of the houses uh you know i i it, kicking kinks and 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 making sure that all that great work you did to put everything on the ground but you can grossly diminish uh, what your output or, or in, the, in the case of the supply line, what your intake is, if, if you're not disciplined in, in how you do it. And, and, but I just think that person needs to be so focused, so disciplined. And the other thing is, you know, we're talking about all these tasks. You're going to multitask and throw lines and help kick kinks and do all of these things. But you also got to pay attention to what's happening on that panel. And know when there's a problem. I, I think that the, the worst thing ever is for a driver to have to know there's a problem because someone called him on the radio and said there's a problem. Um, so there's a lot of things going on. And, and, and to, to dovetail on Scott's point of, of who's in that position and, and who's the best person to be in that position. And yeah, no, it, it is not your turn to drive. It's your turn to drive when you put the effort, energy, and, 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 and put the dedication into uh, you know, showing that you're serious about it. And, uh, and then, and then that's when it'll be your turn, but, but, uh, it's a great topic really, uh, uh, chief. This is, uh, it is truly, I think that this is the guy that's setting those little wheel, wheel pieces of wood out there for the wheels to sit on. And, and, uh, you know, we, we, we will come out and, and everybody will walk out of the house with insulation dripping off their helmets and we'll high five. And that poor driver is over there, you know, sweating he's out of breath because he's running everywhere or whatever and and you know he's gonna he's like a like an offensive guard man he's gonna just go over and sit on the bench drink some gatorade well and you said it i mean it's just you know when 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 paul first brought this topic up to to bobby as an idea um you know we first time i first talked about i was like well and the, the you know the first thought is have we wore this one out because i know i can't tell how many times we've talked about the role and we've done articles well you know what we just spent an hour and 10 minutes if you took the first 10 minutes out, we we're talking about some of our friends we lost. We just spent an hour talking about, I can't even say a fraction of, of everything that goes into the successful driver operator. We left so much good stuff out because there's only so much time. Um, you know, and Terry, you, you talked about, you know, watching that pump panel. 
this, and I, I would say this before I t- turn things over to uh, turn things over to Paul f- to close things out. It, it drives me batty when you hear, you know, Division One or Chief or you know Command or whatever. I'm, I'm down to a quarter tank. What what should I've heard before that? You know what? You didn't tell me I'm down three. You didn't tell me half. You know how, how many times all of a sudden it's like oh I'm down to a quarter tank. What, what the hell just happened? Now the guys inside should have an idea if they're experienced how much water they're going through. But still. There's a guy staring at, you know, if you're working off a tank, you know, tank, tank water, staring at this thing and you're not saying nothing to the guys that are inside beforehand. It's like, I'm down a quarter tank. Well, no, I should have heard something sooner. And, and, and Terry, that, you know, like you said, you, you got to pay attention to what's going on at the pump paddle as well. You know, Paul, and, it, and obviously it was great, great, great having you on here and everything else. And uh, I want to get to a couple other things with you, but cl- close things out for us. All right. You, you know, um, uh, your thoughts on what makes, again, summarize that, that great driver operator. I'm going to leave it at that. What makes for the great driver operator? Yeah, that, that, that particular individual is, uh, is someone that is uh, tactically sound firefighting, um, you know, so they can understand, you know, what is going on that they are affecting. Um, you know, that particular individual is, again, and I, I'm glad it was mentioned that, um, you know, there are a second set of eyes outside. Uh, you know, that's, that's awesome to look at it that way um, because it's true. But, um, you know, that individual needs to be the type of person that's going to take ownership into that apparatus, take ownership into the ultimate responsibilities of, of their position um, and proud of that position and proud of those responsibilities. Um, you know, that's, that's that particular individual's engine that day. They're just giving everybody a ride, right? So, um, you know, and everything on it, be, be uh, very conscientious of the, the, um, the possibilities of what could be faced with, you know, they could be faced with on scene, the adversities, um, and just being proud and understanding that they are going to make or break that fire scene, uh, and, and, and take ownership into that and, um, you know, never settle for, you know, feeling comfortable because in a moment's notice, things could change. Um, you know, it's just so many different things could happen. Um, self-motivated, education-oriented, uh, always looking for something else about the job that's going to make things better and more comfortable uh, on the fire ground. Um, that's that's overall, and of course, I echo what Chief Thompson and Chief McGrath have already mentioned. You know, as far as what they think, but um, you know, great topic. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss it. And of course, like you mentioned, I mean, it's, it's this is. This is a fraction of the things that we could be discussing. Oh. I mean, we obviously never got into you know, the pump pressures and all the other <laughs> little tiny things. That's a completely different day, different topic, different class. But, um, you know, just bringing awareness to this position is, is, is so awesome. Uh, so awesome of a position, so important of a position. And uh, that, but that also requires a lot of preparation. And if you do it the right way and you prepare the right way, you will be prepared on scene to overcome those adversities or at least know where to start. And you need to be able to talk about it, right? Ask people, ask the older guys, all right, when you've been driving, what are some of the things that went wrong for you? Oh yeah, God, exactly. you know, you know, yeah. Remember we burnt that whole city block down. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you how that started. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, this happened and that happened, right? And it, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, someone else is, I mean, you know, a lot of people don't like war stories. A lot of people will consider themselves, you know, I'm, I'm not experienced, but, uh, you know, you can learn just as much from other people's experiences, you know, tell those war stories, you know, talk about the adversities that you, you know, had to overcome, talk about your water supply issues. Uh, but the more importantly, let me, let me, let me close it with this. When you do your training on pump operations, don't make everything perfect. You know, use odd number hose lines. If you got 200 foot pre-connects, you know, you, like you said earlier, you should know what you're pumping 200 foot pre-connects at seven, eight inch tip, you know, on an inch and three quarter hose, you know, you should already know what you're pumping at. Um, you know, simulate some things, drop that down to 150 because you had a ruptured hose line, but 150 will work. Um, you know, throw in some other adversities. You lost your water supply. Uh, what do you do now? You know, train with the adversities. Don't train as if everything's in a perfect world because you're going to become complacent. Oh, exactly. And like I said, my thing, you guys are describing the, the, this, you know, right now, all three of you and at my head right away, I'm picturing, you can always identify and spot the DO that has their act together. Mm-hmm. Just like you can a company officer, how they carry themselves, 
you know, you, you see the guys that are like this and the guys that are kind of the, but you, man, the, the one that's just like, and, and, and Terry Scott, the Gary apples of the world there. I, I, I can never remember ever a time where I looked at Gary was a firefighter driver, as a captain where I go, he was like the coolest laid back when he was a chief state. He just, you know, you, he just, he, he, he had that walk and that air about him was like, I know what I'm doing. Not arrogance. He just, you know, and you can spot those DOs that just from how they walk up to the rig, you know, how they check it, where they set their cup of coffee. I mean, you can go at the ownership you talk about, Paul, that's their rig. They own the rig. They're not just substitute teachers driving for today. That's their pumper. That's their rig. You know, they're the ones that's not filthy, dirty tools aren't rusted. Hose does the pump, pumper doesn't look, does it look like it threw up its hose bed, you know, that, that they're into it. And you can just, you can just see it by how they walk around and how they do things. Our, our friend, Rich Cunningham, Honey, Honeycutt said earlier, uh, he started a 69 Chevrolet front mounted PTO pump. Everything was easier. Well, guy, if we go back in time, but, uh, but nowadays we're not there as much as that'd be cool. You know, thanks rich for that. You know, but, uh, uh, you know what you've got in front of you take ownership i think that's the bit you be passionate about what you're doing take ownership and success follows so paul again uh title uh, the, the 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 one article that people just went bonkers on still do uh with fire engineering magazine what, what's the title of that i know they can search your name but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, fire ground pump operations uh, mastering the panel perfect and if they want to get a hold of you to ask you about you know, ask you for some advice, get some information, maybe have you come out and teach a class or whatever. What's the best email from the reach yet? Uh, P Watlington at Burlington NC.gov. And that's uh, Watlington W A T L I N G T O N P Watlington. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Paul, thank you, buddy. Thank you so much. And I will get back in one second here. Scott, if they want to get a hold of you, buddy, just email. Scott at fireserviceleadership.com. And Chief McGrath. First initial last name, T McGrath at cityoflewisville.com. And I'm, I'm at chieflasky at gmail.com. And Paul, thank you so much. Uh, uh, yep. and, and I'll just say this. Thank thank you to uh, your your boss, your bosses at, at, at the Burlington, uh, North Carolina Fire Department for letting us steal you for a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, every one of us knows what it's like to, you know, to have people that you count on be off doing something else. And uh <laughs> But at the same time, all of us know uh, the good bosses know the importance of having people like you, the talent of the fire service to be able to share their knowledge and insights. And uh, we can't thank you enough, buddy, for coming on the show with us. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Chief McGrath and uh, Chief Thompson also uh, for your insight. And uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Thank fire engineer and Chief Halton, Chief South. I wish they were able to join us today, but I completely understand. Yeah, but, uh, it was- we probably went three hours because we get Bobby and John talking <laughs> about engines. They love engines too. Uh, but, uh, but th- th- that being said, uh, folks, we're, we're pretty much all on the, all the social media uh, venues, if you will, can you get a hold of us? Our next show date is October 20th. Uh, we have the third hump day hangout. Uh, and, and again, between the five of us regulars, our cast of characters, sometimes one of us is missing in action. We got stuff going on, but it's nice. And, and then every now and then we've got a great, great, great guest like we have with, with Paul. Uh, Fire Engineering always has some great shows on Wednesdays at noon central time, uh, one Eastern, besides all the great podcasts uh, they have in the, in, in the evening. Uh, and they're all archived at fireengine.com. You can go to those and grab them all. In closing, and especially right now more than ever, uh, we, we always ask you to please keep the men and women armed forces in your thoughts and prayers. And remember this, please, never forgetting means just that, never forgetting. Be safe and God bless you. We'll see you next time.